Getting ready to buy or sell a home? Do you want to help support pro-life organizations? Then you need Real Estate for Life. Get a top-notch real estate agent and support pro-life causes. Go to realestateforlife.org to learn more. Of Alcala, who is the, the patron saint or the patron of all the lay Franciscan brothers in the Franciscan order. Didicus is a living proof that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. As a young man in Spain, Didicus joined the secular Franciscan order and lived for some time as a hermit. After Didicus became a Franciscan brother, he developed a reputation for a great insight into the ways of Almighty God. His penances were heroic. He was so generous with the poor that the friars sometimes grew uneasy about his very charity. So Didicus then was a Spaniard born at the little town of St. Nicholas de Porto in the Diocese of Seville in the 15th century. From his early youth, he began the perfect the practice of perfect life under the guidance of a pious priest in a solitary church. Then, in order to bind himself more closely to God, he made the profession of the rule of St. Francis in the convent of the Observantine Friars at a place called Aritzafa. Then he bore the yoke of humble obedience and regular observance with great alacrity and devoted himself especially to contemplation, contemplation of the things of our Lord, in which he received wonderful light from God, so that illiterate as he was, he spoke of heavenly things in an admirable manner by a divine gift from the Lord. He was then sent to the Canary Islands to govern the brethren of his order, and there he had much to suffer. He was burning with the desire of holy martyrdom, and by his words and example, he converted many infidels to the faith of Jesus Christ. Coming to Rome in the Jubilee year, in the pontificate of Nicholas V, he was entrusted then with the care of the sick in this famous convent in Rome called Aricelli, Franciscan convent. With such loving charity, he did acquit himself of this duty that the sick wanted for nothing even during the famine in the city. He was sometimes cleansed their ulcers by sucking them. He was remarkable for his great faith, faith and his gift of healing. For by signing the cross upon the sick with oil from the lamp burning before an image of the Mother of God, Our Lady, to whom he had the greatest devotion, he would miraculously cure these souls. At length, when at Alcala, he understood that the end of his life was at hand, clad in an old tunic with his eyes fixed on the cross, he devoutly pronounced these words of the sacred hymn. He said, O sweet wood, sweet are thy nails, and sweet thy burden, thou wast worthy to bear the king and Lord of heaven. He then gave up his soul to God on the day before in November on the year of the Lord, 1463. His body was left unburied for several months in order to satisfy the pious devotion of the numbers who came to see his body. As though already clothed in immortality, it was incorrupt, it was incorrupt, and exha exhaled a beautiful, sweet odor. He was renowned then for making many striking miracles during his life and now at his death, and was enrolled amongst the saints by Pope Sixtus V. What can we learn then, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, about this magnificent saint today, this humble Franciscan? How the humble are exalted is borne out in the very life of Saint Didicus. Born of poor parents in a lonely station and having no schooling of any kind, we said he was illiterate, 
he was able then to discuss the loftiest of matters to the great astonishment then of the wise and learned men of the world. How we need to humble ourselves today and understand our nothingness before God. God is everything and we are nothing. One day we must understand, we must stand before the judgment seat of God. Let us banish then all pride in this earthly pilgrimage so we can be humble like the Blessed Virgin Mary, our sweet mother. Remember all you do, even if it be great in the eyes of the world, must be offered up for God's glory and recognized as a gift from him. Remember well that God has not only called you into existence, but he sustains you in your being. He could easily, in an absolute sense, annihilate you and make you into a non-being. This he will not do because this goes against his essence, because God is love and all he wants is for you to be humble, for you to give him glory and for you to save your soul and help save the souls of your neighbors. Consider those in the world consumed, consumed with vain glory and pride. Do many philanthropic acts as do gooders in the name of helping the poor. These elitists will gain no merit in God's eyes if they are not in a state of sanctifying grace. We can give millions and millions and millions of pounds to the poor, but if we have the wrong intention, the intention of vain glory, and now we're not in a state of sanctifying grace, this counts for absolutely nothing before God. Worse still, if they make these acts of charity for their own glory, this counts as nothing. Be humble then as the widow's might in the gospel. Her penny, as you remember in the gospel, spoke volumes before the seat of God's mercy. The offering of the Pharisees counted for nothing because they had only exterior intentions and were seeking the applause of humans. Consider also the example of Lucifer. Lucifer, endowed with the most brilliant gifts of nature and grace, he contemplated not God, but he contemplated himself. He became puffed up and immediately he was deprived of his throne among the angels as was then thrust directly into hell. Didicus, who was greatly esteemed by the world and by his brethren because of the marvelous things God accomplished through him, nevertheless thought of himself as very little and wished to leave this world clothed in the poor and worn out habit. He was the one who wanted to live the words of Job in the scripture, the words of Job and said, Job, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. As it hath pleased the Lord, so it is done. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In heaven, he received a place once occupied, Didicus, by the proud angels, and gave living sense to the holy verse. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself then shall be exalted. Let us imitate then Didicus today and the Blessed Virgin Mary, the model of humility itself. We do not find in the gospel that Mary, our mother, worked any miracles. How grand of her to have refrained from them. We do not find that she undertook to communicate to others the infused wisdom with which she was filled. How grand is the silence of Mary and how admirable is Mary even in the midst in the most hidden part of her life. Who had better opportunities of attracting attention by teaching and by miracles than she, who was the repository of all the treasures of the wisdom and the knowledge of Almighty God. She was the mother of the sovereign wisdom, of the eternal truth. Nevertheless, she thinks Our Lady only of obeying, of keeping silence and of hiding herself. 
how many amiable virtues, how many touching examples are concealed from our view by her magnificent conduct. Her obscurity, however, is infinitely more instructive than her most striking actions. We had already before our eyes many models for action and for speech, but we needed one to teach us to be silent and to never to act without necessity. She is then the Blessed Virgin Mary, the most holy and beautiful creature, who was the magnifier of the Lord with her profound humility and increased in grace every instant of her earthly life. Be not then a follower of the false worldly humility, which says this contradiction in terms, I am proud to be humble. This is what they say in the world, I am proud to be humble. But be the icon of the humility of Didicus and humility personified in the Blessed Virgin Mary. Amen. May the holy names of Jesus and Mary be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.